So, good evening, everybody. My name is Rahul Chobe. I am from Fijo TV, and I am handing over this session to Dr. Manish. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening to all the Fijo TV viewers. I, Dr. Manish Rai, Assistant Professor from Sanjay College of Physiotherapy, Pune, welcome you all to today's webinar. Return to Sports Bridge Program Post ACL Reconstruction by our renowned speaker, Dr. John Nile. This webinar is brought to you by Physio TV, for which we are grateful to the driving force of our institute, our founder president, Dr. K. H. Sanjiti sir, our ever inspiring chairman, Dr. Parag Sanjiti sir, our dynamic executive director, Dr. Manisha Manisha Sangvi ma'am, and our principal, Dr. Vivek Kulkarni sir, for providing this platform. Before we begin the session, I would like to introduce our panelists. So today we have with us our first panelist, Dr. Ajit Dabolkar, who is a professor and head of sports physiotherapy in School of Physiotherapy, D.Y. Patil University, Nairobi. He is graduate from SIT GS Medical College and postgraduate in musculoskeletal physiotherapy from TNMC, Mumbai. He has completed his PhD from D.Y. Patil University. He has more than 16 years of academic experience. He has 40 plus publications in peer reviewed journals and book chapters in Springer. He is certified Mulligan practitioner, NDS certified kinesio taping certified, trained in kinetic control and certified yoga practitioner. Sports physiotherapist, he, uh, he as a sp uh, sports physiotherapist, he is working in IPL, ISL, FIFA, Under-17 World Cup and World Drive Safety uh, Series recently. So, we it's a pleasure to have you, sir. Then our second panelist is Dr. B. S. Motimat, Associate Professor and HOD of Department of Sports of Physiotherapy in Belgaum. He is also a board member of Board of Studies and member monitoring the Committee of Sports in KLE Academy of Higher Education and Research. Sir has 15 plus years of uh, teaching experience. He has several publications in national and international journals. It is pleasure to have you, sir. Also, our third panelist is Dr. Apurva Shimpi, who is professor and head of community department at Sancheti College of Physiotherapy, Pune. He is graduate from uh, LTM uh, Medical College, Mumbai, and postgraduate from TN Medical College, Mumbai. He is also a fellow in orthopedic and sports from Spalding University, USA, and has served as sports physiotherapist from Maharashtra Cricket Association, International Tennis Federation, Commonwealth Youth Games, and member of organizing committee from Pune International Marathon. He has also 16 plus years of experience. He has authored more than 25 research publications, including a Shimpi's SI tests published in Hong Kong Journal of Physiotherapy. We are pleased to have you, sir. I welcome all the panelists once again. I request the viewers to kindly note uh, that your qu queries will be addressed at the end of the session. So you can put that in the YouTube chat section box. So now I request Dr. Apurva Shimpi to kindly introduce our speaker for today, Dr. John Nyland. I hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Manish, for our kind introductions. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce my dear friend and my mentor, Dr. John Nyland. Dr. Nyland is a professor and program director for the Masters of Science in Athletic Training program at the Spalding University and is also a graduate professor of orthopedic surgery at the University of Louisville. He is a sports certified physical therapist, athletic trainer, and also strength and conditioning specialist. Dr. Nyland is a member of European Society for Sports Traumatology, Knee Surgery, and Arthroscopy. He is also a member of Sports and Orthopedic Section of the APTA the National Athletic Trainers, uh, Trainers Association, the uh, American College of Sports Medicine, and the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Dr. Nyland has, is an international editor review board member for various journals like knee surgery, sports traumatology, arthroscopy, the Journal of Orthopedics and Sports Physical Therapy, uh, 
the arthroscopy that is the journal of arthroscopic and related surgery turkish journal of physiotherapy and rehabilitation and case reports in orthopedics all are well renowned and peer uh, reviewed index journals dr nyland is currently the president of the board of directors of jos pt and also physical therapy consultant with the international grand hospital at kathmandu in nepal he is a past recipient of the excellence in education award given by the sports section of the apta and the john joyce award given by the international society of arthroscopy knee surgery and orthopedic sports medicine he has more than 150 research publications in peer reviewed index journals and has also developed books on innovations in knee rehabilitation and clinical design in therapeutic exercises planning and implementation so it is indeed an honor and a pleasure to have you over here sir and may i hand over the session to you and request you to kindly take the further thank you sir. thank you thank you for the kind words thank you for the kind introduction dr shimpy it's so great to see you again and thank you to all the other panelists for um inviting me and uh, i i look forward to your questions as we go through the talk so I'm going to talk today about return to sports bridge program that we've developed uh, over the last boy 15 years, uh, and we predominantly have uh, patients who've undergone ACL reconstruction. I get my slide to advance. There we go. These are my disclosures. Dr. Shimpy covered them pretty well. I'm I'm involved with a lot of surgical journals as well, and I think that's a benefit. I try to look at the operative note for any patient that I see, because I have a fairly good understanding about their influence on other uh, potential influences on function in regards to the graft used, the placement, whether there's meniscus damage, that kind of thing. So you know the ACL when we reconstruct it. We reconstruct the mechanical part, so we have very good carpentry. We, we've done the carpentry of restoring mechanical function. However, we did not hire an electrician, so we, we don't have a neurosensory organ anymore. We have a uh, mechanical strut, and that influences the outcome right there. Right from the get-go, we're not putting in a tissue that is a real close facsimile of the original tissue. So we know we look at the outcomes in terms of anterior laxity, um, but the most important factors are dynamic knee stability in positions of function and whether or not the person experiences a pivot shift. We need to avoid the pivot shift because that's what leads to prolonged disability and um, injury to adjacent tissues like articular cartilage and menisci. So a lot of what we're doing is making sure that they, they don't have a pivot shift. And that's a concern, particularly when soft tissue grafts are used. So in today's orthopedic practice, we have lots of options. And you know, the Scandinavian groups in, in partnership with Lynn Snyder Mackler at Delaware have identified the concept of a coper who may not need to have surgery at all. But in my experiences, that's a very small percentage and many who can cope at the onset ultimately need to have reconstructive surgery. So I, in my opinion, it's more of a, maybe a time saver at the front end, but ultimately to remain athletically active, many of these people are going to have to have knee surgery or wear a brace or something like that. Um, I know there is exceptions to that in, uh, you know, soccer and other sports, but I think these are mostly amongst the elite, the elite athlete. We're also starting to see more primary repair, and this is a growing area. The, the little uh, title at the bottom of this slide uh, discusses a paper that we presented at the ESCA meeting a few years ago, and uh, basically showing the outcomes of a small cohort and very good outcomes with primary repair, repair and internal bracing. And the picture in the middle of this slide shows this internal brace. In this case, it's in the MCL, but you could put the same internal brace within the ACL, particularly if the injury is near the femoral insertion. And with the blood supply that's there through the superior and middle geniculate arteries, you can get a pretty good repair. I mean, there's stem cells that are being uh, spewed out at both ends of the injury site. And if you provide a scaffold across that site, particularly in the young, you can get a, you can get a, 
a repair that restores both the carpentry, the mechanical part, and also saves all that neurosensory function because all the mechanoreceptors are still there, particularly in the remnant uh, at the ends of the ACL. So I'm gonna present a module here that talks about this rehab progression that I do. And I generally see people after they've had conventional physical therapies, but they're not ready to return to sport. So it's kind of a work hardening for athletes. And uh, I take very much a functional movement-based approach and I very much coach them. It's like uh, a cross between physio and coaching. And a big part of this is restoration of normal active motion, not just at the knee though. We focus too much on the knee for the knee injury. We need to put equal emphasis at the hip. The hip is a ball and socket joint. The hip is the key to having a healthy knee and to having a healthy low back. And uh, I think this is true across all ages and populations, but it's particularly true in athletes. So we're specifically, we're, we're gonna cover the key elements of contemporary rehab post ACL injury and surgery and the efficacy of programs designed to bridge the gap between knee surgery, rehab and return to sports. I was saying earlier during the, when I was chatting, getting our slides up, getting my slides up that um, I think return to sport decision-making is a gold mine right now. And you, you can see the literature on that by Kate Webster from Australia, Tim Hewitt from the US and Claire Ardern from Sweden. Um, this is rife. And th this is really an area that we still don't have a real good handle on um, what's, the, what's the real value and what's the best criteria. And then I'm also gonna talk a little bit about limitations of patient reported outcome measures for adolescent athletes based on my experiences. So the basic tenets of my program are create a healing environment. And I'm not just talking about tissue healing. I'm talking about reducing fear, increasing confidence, increasing ownership of responsibility, changing my role now from being a patient to being an athlete. If you want to be a patient, you're there. You don't need to come see me. But if you want to be an athlete, these are the things I'm going to help you with. We try to do no harm, but you know, when you're pushing the edge of function, conceivably you could create, you know, a mild injury. So we have, we've been blessed with that, but we try, we, we, obviously we don't take unnecessary risks, but we, when we functionally test people, we try to very much simulate what they're going to be going through when they return to their sport. A large part of what I do is education. I want people to understand the importance of having the knee flexed. When the knee is bent 35, 40 degrees, the chances of a non-contact ACL injury are remote. Most non-contact injuries occur when people are in a more extended stance. And uh, no, one no one tells people that. If you tell them that, they'd like, geez, if I knew that, <laughs> I probably wouldn't have hurt my, had my first knee injury. So this is an important bit of information that we try to share. Another concept that I have is I don't want perfection. I tell them that if you try to be perfect, you're never going to take any chances. You have to go into the chaotic realm, just like you will when you play. You have to reduce your fear within that realm where you don't have control. And with that, as my basic premise, I tell them, I just want you to be good most of the time. I just 80% of the time, if you're looking pretty good, how you move, that's perfect. I don't want you to try for perfection because you won't take any chances. So we try to develop confidence, which, you know, the scientific word for that is self-efficacy. Resilience, not just physical resilience, because their energy systems are largely shot when I see them. we got to get their uh, anaerobic metabolism improved quite a bit, but also their emotional resilience to come back. Because particularly the first year upon return, uh, following ACL reconstruction. There's good days where you feel normal and there's days where you feel like uh, you're having a bad day and the knee might be a little puffy or tender and they have to be able to deal with that. We emphasize movement quality over quantity. I, I play around with volume, with sets and reps, but I don't play around with quality movement. I have to see what I need to see in terms of the low back, the hip, the knee, the ankle, the subtalar joint all working together. With home programs, if they don't remember how to do it right, I say, when in doubt, leave it out. We'll fix that when I see you next time. And then we consider biological, biomechanical, and behavioral healing timeframes, which are quite diverse. 
And something I've developed over the last year or two is a huge appreciation for what pediatric orthopedists have to go through because their clients are growing and changing right before their eyes, not just in the bone. I and mean, we always talk about an open physis or a closed physis, but their brain development, everything's changing. They're going from pre-puberty through puberty. It's a very complex profession to be a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. And uh, I'm fortunate enough to be involved with one of the better groups in town here in Louisville. So in general, after uh, ACL reconstruction, we have certain things we focus on. If you look at this as a monthly chart, obviously range of motion, particularly extension early on, you gotta get that early on or you're not gonna get it. And uh, then you have a little bit more leeway with flexion, but you got to get normal range. And as I said earlier, you need to include the hip. But the overarching component of this table is neuromuscular control. And you need to start working on that early, even with simple gait, and then progressing to more athletic type movements. So the program that I follow, that I do, when people come to see me, and we're going to have it again this Saturday, I think I've got 10 on schedule. And we have them now because of COVID. We have patients from all over because um, many cannot go to their college. So they're doing remote education in Louisville. And Louisville, Kentucky is kind of central in the United States. So I have patients from California, from Washington, D.C., uh, from Indiana, Notre Dame University, from Washington University, St. Louis. I have them from all over. And uh, it makes for quite an uh, enlightening and enjoyable experience because you know we, we do individual sessions but we do have overlap so they get to work with each other and compete and it makes it quite uh, exciting so the first session they learn the movements largely based on long axis rotation of the torso making sure we have normal extensibility in muscles that are biarticular a lot of the muscles that attach to the pelvis rectus femoris your adductor muscle group the hamstrings, of course, gastrocnemius. Uh, we got to get normal extensibility there. I'm a big believer in using flat shoes like a Chuck Taylor basketball shoe or a, a running shoe that does not have a high heel. Um, remember, shoes that are made for running are for running. They're not for restoring normal range of motion at joints. And I think too often with a high heel in the running shoe, I think Dr. Shimpy brought this up to me one day and when he was in our clinic about a tight soleus. And we see that a lot. So I get them, we, we got to get that normal range of motion back so that the ankle subtalar joint, the knee and the hip can all work together in harmony. Otherwise, what happens is you throw off that balance and it further stresses the knee. So session one, movement education, very slow movements, working on quality and range of motion. They learn the movements. Session two, we add load to that, usually in the form of a weighted vest. Uh, we use weighted medicine balls. We get to, with the vest, we may get as high as 20% body weight, sometimes higher in professional athletes like linemen in American football. Session three, we do two-legged hopping tasks. Session four, single-leg hopping tasks. Session five, we begin multi-directional, multi-planar, uh, intense uh, agility maneuvers. And then the last three or four sessions or so, we work on um, the weak points where we feel that the athlete still needs to improve, largely based on um, improving their anaerobic metabolism so that they have more resilience. But that's the basic premise. And I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through this. With me, they come in once a week and we spend about two hours per session. So this is the guided session you see in picture A here where I'm flexing the knee, but I'm extending the hip concurrently. And with that, you get a little bit of back rotation too. It's variable depending on the, how tight the athlete is. But it's really important, in my opinion, to restore this. And I, I've, I've mentored or advised with some cricket athletes in India as well, because once you've taken a graft, like a bone patellar tendon bone graft or a quad tendon graft, or if you've had surgical work done on the quad, you have a stress riser where the scar is, and if you do not restore normal functional range of motion, incorporating the hip and the knee, you're going to have breakdown, usually not at the scar itself, but on either side of the scar, usually proximal. So you got to get that range back. And, and, and the, another reason to get that back is sooner or later, they're going to fall and that heel is going to go to their butt. And if they haven't been there before, something's going to get stretched permanently or it's going to get torn. 
So it's really important to establish that. So we work on these uh, structured functional movements, um, neuromuscular control training in different planes. We work in some power activities, um, double leg hopping to single leg hopping, and then agility. And all the time, early on, I let them take whatever rests they need. But as they get into the program, I monitor their rest and we reduce their rest. And um, we have to make sure their tolerance for lactic acid improves so that they're safe to go back to their sport. So progressive hip and knee range of motion, I mentioned earlier the importance of getting extension back. Perform knee flexion and prone with the hip and extension. That's key. That's the foundation of my program. You can progress knee flexion slower than knee extension, and you may have to if they've had a posterior horn repair of their meniscus, or if they've had a root tear, you don't wanna push that too fast, too far, because you wanna make sure you have good healing and collagen remodeling. Um, it's really important to get this high knee flexion back. Like, as I mentioned earlier, it improves the extensibility of the extensor mechanism in the front where the graft may have been harvested, but also if a hamstring graft has been harvested or used, many times the detriment is high knee flexion. So it allows you to work on that strength void that occurred when semi-T uh, was harvested. So um, there's, a, there's a double benefit to working on high knee flexion following ACL reconstruction. So we, and the other thing is you can't just check it off on your box that re, range of motion was reestablished, it's normal. You have to keep revisiting it because every time you increase the strength or power responsibility, the first response in that muscle is going to be to get stiffer and to shorten. So you have to go back and revisit that to make sure that range of motion is being maintained, particularly when you start doing more plyometric type activities. So here's some of the stretches we do. Um, the one on top in, in picture A, that's, the, that's one of the foundational ones I do. And you will always see deficits in that because uh, many times the physios in the US, they only work on knee flexion in sitting or supine because they see a general clientele. And many of your older patients haven't been in prone since they were teenagers. So at least in the United States. So um, it's real important to get them back in prone and to really get that hip extended so that you're taking the slack out of the uh, rectus femoris, which will help you with better patellar mobility. And it will help you not have any tendonitis conditions in the patellar tendon. It will alleviate that completely when you start doing more aggressive activities. And then you see picture B, that's kind of a combination of a piriformis stretch and a modified Thomas test or Thomas stretch. Uh, I use that mostly with adolescent boys who are incredibly tight because they're going through such growing. If you can improve this extensibility, the tendons will be happy. They calm down. You don't have to worry about some type of avulsion injury or chronic strains and iliopsoas or the adductors or anything like that. And then remember the, the knee predominantly moves in the sagittal plane, but you can get to the knee very effectively using the hip through the frontal plane. And even if the knee's not doing so well, you can start getting better knee function by focusing more on side to side movements in the frontal plane through that ball and socket joint, which is so important. So here we see uh, what I'm trying to do. This is just a long axis rotational movement. This young lady's a professional badminton player from Poland. And you see that knee going back and forth like that in the frontal plane, and she's kind of maintaining an isometric position at the knee in terms of flexion extension angle. This is where the quads and the glutes work together. And this is the essence of dynamic knee stability to be able to control that knee position in multi planes in the transverse plane, as well as the frontal plane. So we do slow controlled high quality movements. This is no impact as you can see. So it's perfectly safe. And, um, we create this frontal plane wobble. I call it the Elvis Presley leg, kind of going side, side to side, the hound dog leg. And with this, we teach them. These are teachable moments because they make lots of mistakes and we welcome mistakes. Um, mistakes are blessings if they're done without, you know, in, in the environment of danger. If they're done in a safe environment, these are ideal times to impress upon the patient 
what just happened there and why that has meaning and how we can correct that by moving in a certain way. These are some examples. Uh, a is called a form run simulation. It has all the mechanics of uh, running and jumping, but you never leave the ground. And it's done very slowly. It's a tremendous balance challenge and it uses the whole body. And in this case, we've added load. B is called back step butt kick. It puts a lot of, it stretches out the iliopsoas, it stretches out rectus femoris, and it requires high hamstring function. So I'm stretching out the front where many times the graft has been harvested. We're seeing more quad tendon grafts now than we used to, but those get stiff too, just like BPTB grafts. And then if it's a hamstring graft as well, it, it helps with that last third of high flexion, which the patients tend to lose um, when they've had semi-tendinosis and gracilis harvested. Um, and the picture at the bottom, this shows this long axis rotational movement. I published this in a monograph for the orthopedic section of the American Physical Therapy Association about 10 years ago now, but it's still one of our foundational exercises where it has all the mechanics that require quadriceps and hip coactivation or synergy, and it's low risk because it's no, it's no impact essentially. So it's a very good one to start. It could actually be started much earlier post-surgery. So I'm also a big believer that we don't get enough foundational strength. I like to know what the strength level is before I start taking chances with plyometric activities. So we try to get the quadriceps strength back. We get that range of motion back at the knee. I mentioned that several times now about how that influences BPTB, quad tendon and hamstring graft. You need to strengthen the hip, particularly its capacity for abduction and external rotation. And many times we strengthen it concentrically, but its function is eccentrically. So it's, its function is decelerating adduction and internal rotation with jump landing. So we begin more concentric, but functionally we're trying to restore it, how it um, can decelerate those mechanisms of hip internal rotation and adduction that occur with single leg jump landings. So we look through the whole lower extremity as well as the low back. We work on the core too. Our goal is to improve dynamic mid-range knee stability most of the time. And you know, another goal, we don't work just on the surgical knee. We work on both sides because they're much more likely to have an ACL injury now at the, the contralateral side after having had uh, ipsilateral knee injury and reconstruction. So we work on uh, both sides and we use progressive resistance exercises. I'm a big advocate of the single leg leg press for composite lower extremity strengthening with a target goal of about uh, body weight or more for an eight repetition maximum. I don't like to go below an eight repetition maximum because the weights go up and I think there's more of a risk for injury. The real benefit with weight training is just to make sure that you have foundational strength that's roughly equivalent to the contralateral side. Once you're there, I think you're gonna get much more benefit out of more functional movements, uh, predominantly closed chain. So here's some examples of different movements. At the top in A, you see sideline hip abduction. That's one of the things you do more early in PT. Uh, but I really focus on terminal knee extension in that plane. Since we're not in the sagittal plane, we're in the frontal plane. This is an ideal position to work on terminal knee ex uh, extension while they do the hip abduction because they don't feel as much discomfort under their kneecap or by their patellar tendon. It's kind of tricking the knee. The knee thinks it's a hip exercise, but if you focus on the knee and, and the patient thinks it's a hip exercise, but you can really tweak out what uh, knee extension you want there. So that's a nice way to uh, get that back. And there's my single leg press in the next picture in B. And then we make, we, we use a variety of different implements, nothing too sophisticated. We find things, we find bleachers, we find chairs, we find steps, whatever we have, but probably the meat and potatoes, we call it of what I do uh, for most people, particularly in their home program are in item D and item F on this slide where the single leg lateral step up, the young lady's holding a 12 pound medicine ball over her head. She's wearing a weighted vest, probably with 10% body weight. And then F is the single leg lateral scissor plank. So I'm getting, depending on trunk position, if you look at D, if she's erect in the trunk, I'm getting lots of quads. As she starts to lean forward into flexion of the trunk, 
I'm getting more glute. So I can compare that side to side and see if I'm getting my natural balance back. Ultimately, the goal is to have that trunk just as straight up as possible compared to the non-surgical side. And then in picture F, this is giving me lots and lots of abduction and external rotation at the hip as she uh, abducts concentrically the leg on top and has to hold position on the lower leg. So once again, we do these bilaterally, and this is a big part of the home exercise program. We get, we get creative, we have fun, we, we pair them up sometimes. This is called the athletic ready position, the young lady in the slide on the left. And then there's a single leg ready position, the one in the center. And then we have to take this basic premise of what's considered a safe postural position and we need to translate it into functional movements. So in so doing, we'll create puzzles, we'll create dilemmas, uh, safe ones, but we do push the edge a little bit. We don't take excessive risk, but we do push the edge because we have to be functioning within realities of what they're gonna be going back to. And then we also identify um, where their deficiencies may still be. I'm a firm believer that as long as you want to be athletically active, you have neuromuscular control exercises that you need to do to maintain things. Remember, there is no evidence that any type of mechanoreception comes back in that graft that went into your knee. You might have some minimal return on that if some of the mechanoreceptors in the remnant of the original ACL tear were preserved, but not anything near what it was prior to the index injury. So here's some other examples. We do lots of lunge type movements. This is called the matrix exercise. This gentleman in picture B, he's a defensive lineman for the Jacksonville Jaguars of the NFL. Uh, we got him back in the league after being out with shoulder problems and knee problems. And uh, we were quite proud of that. But we do a lot of multiplanar things. We use stable surfaces, unstable surfaces. And it's always done with a purpose. And you see, he's going pretty fast there, but that matrix exercise is usually done very, very slowly. He's probably got 50 pounds in that weighted vest too. And those are weighted boxing gloves. But um, you basically use what you have. You don't have to have a lot of specialized equipment. The other thing is power. You know, ultimately, if you want to get fast twitch muscle fiber back, you got to be getting that reaction time in that muscle really quick under very explosive conditions. So this is a young man who was a revision ACL reconstruction patient. And, uh, you know, I had, I, I had to make sure he was, he was really strong and could protect himself before returning him to play. And one of the things we talk about is the words we use. We don't say good leg, bad leg. One of the problems I have is having the physio tell the client that, they want to walk up the stairs and, you know, they're going to go up with uh, the good leg first and come down with the bad leg first. And um, words that have meaning and uh, I don't like good and bad. I like surgical, non-surgical and the word pop, you know, we always, uh, when someone hurts their knee, did you feel a pop? Did you hear a pop? The words we use now, this knee has been reconstructed. It's almost good as new. So I want you to really pop that movement. I want you to really, I want you to really get it. I want you to really push, you know? So we, we use the words differently and uh, um, it's important because we we're trying to decrease their fear and build their confidence. So with any type of plyometric movement, it's somewhat of a dilemma because we want that explosiveness, but we want a very controlled soft landing like a cat. I use a lot of analogies with cats and how cats land when they jump. So here's some different jumping. In picture A, this is a two-legged kangaroo hop. This is for verticality. So I'm looking to see, do they use each leg the same? B is called the frog hop. That is a, basically a standing broad jump. It's not done continuously. They get to reset and do another one, but they're trying to max out their horizontal distance. And then we progress to one-legged activities. And sometimes we slow it down where they hop over a tape, a tape like a um, what do you call it? A yellow uh, emergency um, tape. <laughs> they, they step over it or hop over it and then they have to hold position. And then we have them do it sometimes with their eyes closed so that we're taking away the feedback that they get from vision. So there's lots of ways to tweak 
the fast twitch muscle fiber. But this is plyometrics is probably the most central part of that. And then they move into agility training of a variety of things being very creative. But we begin with slow, slow to fast movements. And then small amplitude, couple steps to larger amplitude, more complex movements. And we want them to explore before they perform. And perform means you have a certain task that you need to do. Um, whether you're a, a cricket player, a cricket bowler, a soccer player, American football player, what have you, a tennis player, you know what you need to do when you do a two-handed backhand or something. But I want ex exploration first where they maybe come up with more than one solution because too often after ACL injury or after reconstruction, movement paths become constrained and they become one trick ponies. They only know how to do something one way. And the chaos of the sport is not going to allow that to be successful. They have to be able to have alternative motor plans that allow them to be successful. This is the essence of what we do with motor learning and motor re-education. So, you know, when they come from PT, most of the time everything's planned out, right? You know, I'm going to do my straight leg raises. I might do my mini squats. I rode the bike for 15 minutes or what have you, or I ran maybe a mile. Everything's choreographed. Everything's planned. But when you release them back to sport, you're releasing them back to chaos. There's this word called a coach. And these coaches... The successful coaches are successful because they're obsessed with winning and they're obsessed with performance and they really don't care if this person's ready or not. If you said they're ready, they're going to use them if they think they can win. So you have to prepare the athlete for all of the different stressors that they're going to be presented with. We use a term here a lot in the States, and I know it gets pretty hot in India, particularly in the summertime before the monsoon. And, um, uh, you know, we acclimatize and we always think of it in terms of getting, you know, getting used to the heat and humidity. But I like to say that you have to acclimatize to the other stressors too, to being yelled at, to not getting adequate rest, to being pushed to your limits that you have not been pushed to since uh, before your injury. So you know, they didn't get that in therapy. And, 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 I, and, and all in defense of the therapist, you know, during acute care, you, that's really not the time to do that anyway. So, but they need to be prepared to that, for that and always focus on quality. So in addition to seeing me once a week, they do once weekly independent sessions. And I mentioned earlier, the single leg lateral step up, the lateral scissor plank. And then we integrate running. I like to develop an aerobic base of about two miles. I mean, unless this is a specific track athlete in general for the average court sport person, um, they get a baseline of a couple miles. And then we, once they can do that with a reasonable time, then we get into sprinting first straight aheads and then multi-directional. The multi-directional though, I have them do that with me predominantly. I usually let them do straight aheads on their own during the week when they're ready but they always start out the same way. First one, 50% effort, because I don't want them to pull a hamstring or pull a hip flexor or pull a calf. That would set us way back. And we've been very successful with this. I have not had knock on wood, uh, hamstring or uh, groin pull or hip flexor pull as part of recovery at a high end following ACL reconstruction yet. I know there's always a first time, so I'm hesitant. I'll probably eat my words tomorrow or Saturday, but um, we haven't had that yet. But they progressed from 50%, 75%, 100% uh, their volitional effort just to make sure that they're adequately warmed up and prepared. And then they'll do the single leg press for me during the week. So they're doing some of their rote strength training during the week. And I send them new numbers. I ask them what their rate was. They do both sides. They alternate. But the progression is six sets generally, 12, 12, 10, 10, 8, 8. Remember, we peak around body weight or a little bit more for the final set of eight repetitions with each leg. And uh, for many people, we get well beyond body weight, but it really depends on what the athlete is capable of and what they need to do. And if, if this is the best way I can develop that strength, then I do that. So then we get into some agility movements. This is called the circuit. Uh, this is a little soccer player from uh, Congo who's going to school at uh, Louisville. And then a movement called short ball tall. I don't have a video of that, but you send the, the, 
the coach, the physio coach yells to the athlete to get to each of these objects as quickly as possible. Then they come back to the center of the triangle, lay on their belly or their back, and they alternate doing this for 30 second intervals, three to five 30 second intervals. And then depending on the sport, we do things like pole cutting. I bring out these PVC pipes that I've created with little duct taped nails at the end, and they run an obstacle course out at the park. But these are some examples. You got to create functional puzzles. And uh, look at the girl on the far left. She's got her eyes closed and she's a simple ACL reconstruction, nothing too complex here. But boy, she, she's just having, when you take the eyes away, you can really work on the somatosensory system more. So uh, using vision denial can be a very strong thing. The girl in the center, she's a gymnast working on core as well as working on uh, strengthening whole body while standing on an unstable surface. And the girl who jumped uh, on the blocks, she, is a, uh, she got a full ride scholarship to play field hockey. She was the field hockey player of the year in Kentucky a couple years ago. She plays for the University of Louisville now. Now these plyo blocks, these soft plyo blocks, I love them. But you know, as much as you look at that and say how physically demanding that is, I really don't use them for that. And we start very low. I use them to see how psychologically demanding it is for the athlete and what's their frame of mind and whether or not they are willing to risk falling, to risk trying it. And I don't, I, I don't tell them they have to do it, but we start going up. And once it gets above their waist, then they start questioning themselves. And I'm really just trying to see where they are in regards to their ability to deal with chaos and the unknown, because when they return, they're not playing unless they're ready to deal with the unknown, unless they're gone. And if you ask them the simple question sometime, maybe when they're getting a drink of water, when you did that last drill, were you thinking about your knee? If they say yes, they're not ready to play. They're not ready to go back. That's a simple thing that I've found to be very effective. So we try to get sports specific, uh, depending on what they do. The young lady here doing kind of a fall simulation, these little somersaults, shoulder rolls. She's a, a jockey, an exercise rider at Churchill Downs, our racetrack here in Louisville, who had a, she was here for a shoulder problem. But I try to figure out what energy systems they use. Remember soccer, uh, basketball backcourt, you're talking about glycolytic system, two minutes of continuous activity predominantly, things like shot put, explosive movements, you're talking about, you know, 10 to 20 seconds or so. So the recovery periods are different. The expectations of performance are different. The diets are largely the same, but in any of the energy systems, you got to increase their tolerance, their workload tolerance, and their resilience to come back. There's not much evidence to support that ACL injury is directly related to fatigue, but I can assure you fatigue is an underlying situation that changes biomechanics. It changes uh, the psychological confidence of the person. So even though we don't have a lot of hardcore evidence to saying fatigue is, an, is a contributor to index ACL injury, I think it certainly is a contributor to effectiveness and outcome following ACL reconstruction. So we try to get people together in competitive situations too. In regards to bracing, I'm not a big advocate of rigid ACL bracing. We see them many times the surgeon prefers them. My colleague, Dr. Caborn, likes to say that the brace is really there to protect the surgeon, not to, predict, not to protect the knee of the patient. And I think there's some truth to that. I see bracing evolving more towards soft garments. This is the T25. It's a device that we've done some studies with. We've published one paper. We have another one out under review. But it basically, in my opinion, struts the IT band and provides better frontal plane control of the knee. And we have some very good data to support this that was published in the first paper. And if you can control the frontal plane better, as Tim Hewitt has so elegantly mentioned in many of his presentations, you're largely, you're heading in the right direction to preventing uh, primary ACL injury. We know with rigid bracing, it can have a problem with changing knee kinematics. It changes muscle activation patterns. With the force trap system, it can change the circulation. I think there'll always be a place for rigid bracing. However, I think that place is a smaller subset of patients than we've been led to believe. And uh, I just see more coming forward in the area of sports garments that are more forgiving. 
that provide protection, but not constraint. So return to play decision making, that's where I came in about this talk. And that's really where my, my heart is and what I do now in clinical practice. I think it's the most challenging thing. And I know physiotherapy systems in the world are different than in the US where very many times the physiotherapy in the US being uh, entirely insurance driven is capitated well before uh, you get to the place where you can make these decisions. And uh, I think that's highly unfortunate because the expertise of the physio is largely greatest, more, most greatly needed during their return to play decision making. So at the very least, I push for a multi um, professional model of decision making. Uh, I don't like, I, I can make the call based on function, but I always run it by the surgeon too. But I don't like it when the surgeon makes the call and they've never seen the person move. If they make that decision based on time post-surgery, that's very erroneous. There's a lot of fallacies with that. Uh, you really don't know what their status is for neuromuscular control. And I think that's what's largely led to having a sort of a high incidence of contralateral primary knee injuries. So when I'm making the decision to return them to practice, which is largely what I do, and then I let the athletic trainer who's working with the team and the coach decide when they're ready for competition, I like to see them practice for a couple of weeks without complaint before they put into competitive experiences. But they shouldn't show any evidence of limb favoring, and they should have uh, no knee effusion. So with functional testing, I go, you know, I don't do the six meter time top. I, I do 20 meters. I like the center of the uh, soccer circle on the, on the soccer pitch. And uh, we do a single leg timed hop, sim, single leg time crossover hop, a triple hop for distance. Those are my meat and potatoes. Of, of those, the one I put the most stock in is the triple hop for distance. I think that's a wonderful functional test. We have five categories of return to play decision-making, form, dynamic knee stability, lower extremity power, agility, reaction time, and endurance speed and skills. And if you look at the last column, this was obviously set up for a basketball player. So we choreograph it to the sport and where we have that freedom is most largely in uh, that category of speed and skills. So I would come up with different things for a cricket player than I would for a soccer player. And then I'd have to know about what position they played and what the expectations were. And this gets back to the primary injury too. How did they injure themselves? Because that's the movement that they probably have some residual fear about. And we need to make sure that we adequately simulate that movement to see if they're truly ready. So once they're released, they're given things to work on based on their weak points, usually some things related to neuromuscular control. Many times some things related to extensibility or flexibility. You see this young lady doesn't have any flexibility issues. She's a black belt Taekwondo um, com competitor in the United States, but everyone gets periodic updates and they stay in touch. So that's basically my program. Now, what makes this talk a little different is I actually have evidence now. This it was conceptual and we've published our first uh, set of 150 primary ACL reconstruction patients. So I'll just show you this, you can see the demographics. Um, and uh, we've talked about the program that they followed. And we talked about what they did at home. And we talked about how I tested them. The other information we get is the subjective um, patient reported outcome survey, the, the knee outcome survey sports activity scale, which was developed by Dr. Jay Ergang at University of Pittsburgh. And I use this at the end of the sessions. And when they do the score at the end of the sessions, I also have them reflect back to when they started and do one for how they felt they were when they started the sessions. When they first come in, I ask them for the global score, but they don't do the calculated score. So I get some indication of where they thought they were after therapy. And then I get some information about where they think they are in addition to objective testing at the end of my program. Um, one of the reasons we don't do functional testing when they start my program is I don't think they're ready for anything like that. They're, they're not ready. They, they're lucky if they've done any kind of single hop test yet. So I'm not gonna take a chance on having them get hurt. So when we do the testing, we try to test them on the same surface that they're gonna play on, whether it's grass or artificial turf or basketball court, tennis court, wearing the appropriate shoe. So if it's a cleat, 
If it's a basketball shoe, what have you, they wear that. Testing usually takes about two hours and it has the categories I mentioned earlier. And I've mentioned these strength tests. So uh, I basically showed you everything that we do for assessment. Some things that we add to the agility test when we do our testing is the 5105, which is a shuttle drill, which usually is a timed event that has a time very similar to a 40 yard dash. And then the NFL L drill, which is a running directional change movement that creates a uh, crossover cut at the knee, which is a very stressful event. If they're going to pivot shift, they're going to pivot shift during the event, during the NFL L. We also do this testing without the knee brace on. If the athlete really wants to wear the brace, they are welcome to. I don't deny it, but almost everybody wants to test without the brace on. The braces are not very popular, and uh, they, they, even though they're going to have to wear it when they go back, when I test them, uh, if that's what the surgeon wants, uh, when I test them, by and large, they don't wear the vest, the brace. So here's the outcome showing that a very high percentage um, achieved uh, symmetry. We still had some significant difference, a little bit in a slower single leg timed hop, and in a uh, a little bit decreased distance with a single leg triple hop for distance. Um, we, we got to improve on that, but that's on average. By and large, we're uh, functioning at a pretty high level. Um, the global knee outcome survey score at program entry was 75. Post-program, it's about 91. So they obviously see perceived improvement. There's also a score on that inventory, uh, how you rate uh, your knee and almost everybody that starts the program rates their knee as abnormal, sometimes nearly normal, and almost everyone at the end rates their knee as normal. Now, when they did the re-estimate of the knee outcome survey sports activity scale, um, they didn't. They scored themselves almost 20 points lower uh, than they did um, when they entered the program. Remember, the, the, when they entered the program, it's a global score. So you just say, how do you think your, where do you think your knee is compared to your other side? Oh, it's about 70, 75%. But when they complete the program and you ask them to revisit that, both with calculated and global score, it's about a 20% reduction, which is very interesting to me. So if you look at this, I think what happens when they come in, they haven't been challenged in traditional physio. They've just done the straight leg raises, the mini squats, maybe a few functional movements, but nothing where they've been challenged through fatigue or high-end plyos, that kind of thing. So I think they've developed some false confidence. I don't think they're very good at assessing where they really are. And what they do over the course of this program I have with them over these eight weekly sessions supplemented with home program is I think they develop a real, more, a more valid perception of their true sport readiness. So another thing we followed was their perception of whether they returned back to sports at their pre-injury performance or skill level. And a very high percentage said they did, higher than anything I've seen in the literature. But once again, I must tell you, this is their perception. Whether this is true or not, I don't know at this point. We need to really figure out what we need to measure to say that they're at the same performance level. That's a very um, difficult thing to really pick out. And it might be different based on the age of the person and the sport they play. But by 6.8 years on average after surgery, we had 10 subjects who were re-injured. 2.7% were non-contact contralateral injuries. 1.3% were non-contact ipsilateral injuries. And this is significantly lower than any previous report um, about um, re-injury after ACL with or without a bridge program. So we're proud of that. We went further and looked at the comparisons between those who were re-injured and those that did not sustain another injury. And we found that the ones that tended to be re-injured were younger, which would fit with the literature. And they're of interest to us was they were also the ones that seemed to make the biggest improvement in perceived function. Now, looking into it further, um, these were people who largely played American football and they tended to have a bone patellar tendon bone graft because that was selected for them because they're American football players. So the bone patellar tendon bone graft, because it has bone plugs, does not have much slippage. It tends to be a more sturdy fix. So if they had had a concomitant MCL injury at the time of the uh, index knee injury, 
the bone patellar bone graft is probably going to do a little bit better job of trying to make up for that laxity in the MCL as well as reconstructing the ACL. But we did also find that a higher percentage of those who sustained re-injury had either concomitant meniscus or MCL injury or, or, or collateral ligament injury at the time of the index knee injury, mostly the medial side. So this MCL injury, if you have anybody with an isolated MCL injury, this is not a benign thing, particularly if it's grade two, because that laxity is not going to go away. And that laxity is going to have an effect on whatever is done for the ACL. So personally, I'm a believer of doing, asking the surgeon to do something a little surgically on the MCL, maybe with PRP or some type of suturing or something to get rid of that residual laxity. But you need to take that into account when you're working with your patient, particularly young ladies, if they go into a genuvalgus loading pattern, because they're just going to stretch out whatever graft they have in their knee. So the ones that we said were higher risk, the ones that sustained re-injury tended to be younger. They thought they had better improvement with the knee outcome survey. They had greater use of bone patellar tendon bone or quadriceps tendons, which would the literature would not support. The literature would say your re-injured ones would be allografts or hamstring. We did not find that to be the case. But the reason that was is because it was directly related to the collisions and contact associated with American football. But the ones that did re-injure had had a higher percentage of partial meniscectomy or meniscus repair and concomitant collateral ligament injury at the time of the index ACL injury. I'm almost done. I, I thank you for your patience. I want to talk to you a little bit about something that I'm really excited about right now. And uh, I think it's going to be a growing part of uh, physiotherapy uh, research and practice in the future. I don't know how many of you are familiar with sports identity in adolescence. If, if you look up what an adolescent is, depending on which association you read, whether it's pediatrics or pediatric orthopedics or what have you, that is a range from 10 or 11 to 29 or 30. Remember I told you earlier about all these different systems that are changing and growing and developing not the least of which is the brain. And um, I'm, I'm not sure if I've reached the age of reasoning yet, and I'm not exactly young. So um, we, have a lot to, we have a lot to work on in the brain and the thought process with the athletes that we see. And I'm not just talking about kids, I'm talking about young adults too. So there's this thing called sports identity for closure which it tends to occur in late adolescence normally as the individual, let's say the high school college athlete, as they get older, what do they do? You know, maybe they have a family, they get married, they, they get a house, they have other responsibilities, their profession, what have you. So their identification solely as being an athlete starts to shrink. But um, so by avoiding sole identification as an athlete, and developing more complex self-identities, uh, they tend to uh, be able to better manage uh, stresses and the stresses of failure. This is a naturally occurring thing. Lilly found that to ease the transition away from competitive sports and possible and potential negative self-esteem, many college athletes proactively reduce their athletic identity prior to discontinuing competitive sports. So this is a naturally occurring process. That's why if you look at ACL literature, people have, look at the population age. If the population age is 25, you should expect a much lower re-injury rate because these people are growing up. They're doing other things. But if you see a lower re-injury rate amongst a group who's 17 or 15, that's impressive because that's a group that's still identifying themselves solely as an athlete and going at it very hard. So make sure you really search into what population you're looking at. This is a cool paper by Bitta Brewer. Over the first two years post ACL reconstruction, many patients, these are ACL reconstruction patients, gradually decreased their athletic role identification. And you know when the largest decrease occurred? Six to 12 months post-surgery. That's right when we're making the decision about return to play. They are already, whether this is conscious or subconscious, 
they are already calculating that there is something here that is leading me toward, toward not identifying myself solely as an athlete anymore. The beginning of kind of this athletic foreclosure. Now it's important for us as therapists to make sure that this is not like the end of the road, that there's much more to athletics. Maybe we just need to help them redefine what it is that they're looking for in athletics. You know, it should be some lifelong health type things, but I highly encourage you to read that paper. So the combination of extremely limited recent sports task experience, high athletic self-identity and obsessive sports passion in the rehabilitating adolescent athlete may contribute to many being released back to unrestricted sports too soon. They are obsessed with their sport. They have a passion for their sport, but they're not capable of making this reasoning uh, on their own. For these reasons, patient reported outcome surveys regarding perceived return to sports readiness administered during or immediately after standard PT may not be accurate given the lack of understanding and emotive state of the adolescent athlete. They love it too much. Just like my, my uh, clients who come in and say I'm 75, 80%, they're not. They think they are. And I don't tell them that they're not right. I don't say you're right or wrong. I just say, well, that's interesting. And then we'll ask them again. And they, to a person, they'll say, no, I'm more like 50%. And uh, I'll say, you know what? I think you're right. Um, but that's really, um, it, that's very insightful of you because you haven't been exposed to the demands of being an athlete during physio. So now you're being exposed to those demands. So you're kind of resetting your threshold of, of where you think you are. That's natural, I believe. So in summary, the purpose of this program and bridge programs anywhere are to correct or minimize the influence of associated impairments and conditions such as hip weakness. Don't forget the hip. Develop an active neuromuscular control learning environment using social cognitive theory principles. That's really a talk in itself, but that's basically coaching, learning from each other, pointing out good things, reinforcing good things, pointing out mistakes, but not saying they're bad. Talk about the mistakes and what that means in terms of function and how to improve them. You have to become like a rehab Sherpa. You guide the athlete through not just physical things, but cognitive appraisals, their emotions, their behaviors, their fears. Combine perceived function assessments with evidence-based objective clinical and field testing. We need to continue to improve criterion-based assessments, particularly, <coughs> excuse me, psychobehavioral readiness, emotional readiness, resilience, perceptions of what athletics means to them too. And we need to provide homework and update it periodically. So in conclusion, supplementing primary ACL reconstruction with standard physical therapy and standard physical therapy with a return to sport bridge program prior to release to play to unrestricted sports performance, um, improve patient outcomes and decreased ipsilateral knee re-injury and contralateral, contralateral knee injuries. In addition to physiological benefits, the return to sports bridge program provides athletes with more time to reflect about their true sports readiness, self-identity, and passion. I think this is a big component. We're not just taking time to develop neuromuscular control. We're buying them time to reflect on what sports means to them. Limited recent sports tasks experiences, high athletic self-identity, and obsessive sports passion may contribute to many athletes being released to unrestricted sports participation too soon. Thank you very much. And once again, I'd like to thank the panel and I'd like to thank my good friend, Dr. Shimpy. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so I would li like to hand it over to our panelists that if they have any questions, they can go ahead. Thank you so much for the wonderful um, talk. It was quite enlightening, sir. I think um, uh, there was um, the bridge was more of going beyond what we do in physiotherapy at an OPD level. 
and targeting and making it more complex and more compound so that it becomes more into you know towards more uh, sport specific i think that was a take away message and i found your slide sports readiness perception you know the sports readiness perception was one of the hallmarks of this talk and it's very important that how much perception um the athlete um, is all about what about what about his perception you need to really evaluate his perception uh, and really find out whether he actually perceives it right or wrong and then correct at the same time i would like to ask you sir ki if there, there is lot of chaos uh, in with respect, with respect to return to sport criteria it, it has become like a holy grail you know is there any ideal um, return to sports criteria because there are so many um, so many clinical practice guidelines which have come up and everybody has its own uh, way of putting it out uh, this is the, the return to sport criteria and that is why i have used the holy grail is there is something like an ideal return to sport criteria or uh, should we have some uh, you know uh, some tenets or some salient features which we can uh, you can highlight us Thank you for your question. I agree that's uh um that's the the most complex component of what we have and that's really where no matter what we've done up to that point whatever happens once we release them that's going to decide our fate as how effective we were. So I'm going to answer that question like a politician, but I but I'm not a politician. Mm-hmm. There are some very good criteria out there. There's some that have been reported by um Risberg and the Norwegian group and Lars Ingebrigtsen. There's some reported by Lin Snyder Mackler. You probably can find the evidence basis of criterion return to sport after cruciate ligament injury in the recent uh clinical practice guidelines published in JOSPT. But I would tell you as a clinician you should get copies of those and look at those and see if you can glean those parts of those criteria that you think would best serve the population of patients and clients who you see in your country in your region in your country and uh you could decide to follow one of the guidelines exclusively or you could create your own using the evidence from other supportive uh, peer reviewed guidelines in creating mine what i what i created when when i was at the university of kentucky we did almost exclusively allograft acl reconstruction and i thought they were pretty fantastic i i did not think they had the reinjury rate that some people have reported with them but nonetheless we did have some that got reinjured and i was their physio So I had made the decision during acute care that they were ready to go back to sport. And once you've seen one or two of these people come back and they've been re-injured, it tears at your heart and you start to think, what did I do wrong? And I realized that the only thing I had done wrong was thinking that I was in the situation to make that decision based on what I could do with the patient during acute care because during acute care you have many other things you have to work on you have to get their range back you have to make sure the wound doesn't get infected you have to make sure they start getting toned that they can do gait that they can do ADLs you have so many other things you have to work on within a brief period of time that uh this small component of athletic prowess they're not ready for you to work on that with them so either you have unlimited time to be able to follow them which would be ideal or you need to create a bridge a bridge program and i think a bridge program needs to have a sports physio involved but i think it needs to have others involved too and i don't like to make the decision to return to play exclusively i like to have the surgeon involved i like to have the coach involved and with adolescent athletes i like to have the parents involved and i will finish my response to this question just by saying many times the true problem is the parent and uh the parent who has unrealistic expectations 
and the parent who will play the surgical card with you saying, well, the surgeon says she can go back to play. And what she doesn't understand is I used to train the surgeon. So I, I was orthopedic faculty at the University of Kentucky and the University of Louisville. So the surgeons who send the patients to me, they, they like me and I like to think they respect me. So my opinion does carry weight. But I think many times the expectations are, are not good. So there is no perfect criteria, but I would encourage you to develop your own based on the evidence-based criteria that currently exists. Uh, what is, uh, so what is your opinion about um, uh, psychological readiness? And how do you evaluate it? Yeah, well, I'll tell you this, girls are more honest about psychological readiness. Boys are macho. Boys will not say they're afraid, but they are afraid. But that's okay. If they don't want to say they're afraid, I, I don't want to take away their macho-ness. But they are afraid too. So don't underestimate that the boy is having fear. And sometimes when the boy shows you what seems like, boy, they are cocky, they're, what they're really doing is hiding their fear. And um, so I think everyone's afraid. And I, something else I think that needs to happen is during your therapy or on the pitch, during your testing, they need to fall down. And it, I know that sounds cruel, but they need to be going at a high enough intensity that they might slip, they might fall just like if they would at a practice and they know they can get up. The, the key time is not when they fall, is what they do after they fall. And if they get right back up, that's so important to them at a conscious or subconscious level that uh, they're no longer a patient. Now they're an athlete. Um, but I agree with you. The psychological component of uh, fear of movement or fear of re-injury, um, we have a lot more to learn in these regards. And I encourage you to look at some of the qualitative papers that have been published by Lissy in the Journal of Athletic Training. And then the Australians, I bit a brewer, uh, just tremendous work on psychology. Uh, Terry Chemlewski on um, kinesiophobia. Um, but I think the best literature on that tends to deal with uh, female populations because I think they're more forthcoming about their fears. Thank you so much. Another question I have, sir, is, um, what do you think about uh, uh, how early should be the neuromuscular training? Because it's one of the pillars in the rehab program. And um, where it should start and where it, it should, uh, you know, land uh, at the end. How complicated it should be at the sports-specific task. I think it's like... Uh it overarches the entire period. Obviously you can do more with perturbation and more aggressive things, you know, once they're through acute care, but early on, you're gonna get them back to weight bearing and gait. And you can start doing early neuromuscular control exercises of low intensity, even on the table before they're weight bearing to just look for neural responsiveness. Um, whether you're using biofeedback or you're having them use their hand to feel tone you can teach them both to try to optimize their quad set, but maybe also to activate the quad set quickly. Um, the literature would suggest that from uh, complete relaxation, we cannot contract the muscle quickly enough to protect ligament injury, but the athlete does not begin at complete relaxation. They begin at a certain baseline of activation and with neuromuscular control training, you can certainly heighten the muscle activation responsiveness so that you can keep the joint from going too far too fast. And if they do sustain an injury, perhaps it's not as bad an injury. So um, to use neuromuscular control training in some form, you could start, you could start in my opinion, right after surgery, but it wouldn't be the same uh, intensity or with perturbation. If it was perturbation, it would be very light perturbation. Um. With the uh, ideal return to sports criteria, uh, do we look forward for uh, no re-injury rates? Is it something which I'm thinking loud? A lower rate? Uh, injury, uh, re-injury rates, lower yeah. re-injury rates. 
with an ideal uh, return to sports criteria, uh, taking into consideration uh, all the clinical and functional testing and field tests, uh, and even taking into consideration psychological readiness. Am I looking for something like a lower re re-injury rate? Yes, and I would encourage you to get a lower re-injury rate than what I've found, because according to the literature, looking at the Moon study and looking at um, reports by McCulloch out of Ohio State and others, and some meta-analyses, um, our rates were lower than that was reported in the literature. But I still think we have a long way to go. And I think um, the predominant place to look at re is not re-injury of the surgical knee, it's injury to the contralateral knee. That seems to be the big problem now. And, um, you know, it very, much, it very much tells us that an ACL injury is not a unilateral injury. It's a bilateral injury. And some of the GATE studies uh, that have been published in medicine and science and sports and exercise recently are showing that it's not that the surgical side starts to resemble the non-surgical side with GATE over time. It's that the non-surgical side tends to change to better match the surgical side. So what's happening is we are starting to develop compensations on both sides. So we really have to look at this as a holistic approach, very much bringing in the brain and movement quality and um, the psychological aspects are essential. So I think we have a long way to go, you know, just looking at re-injury rates if they don't have any exposures, then they're going to have a low injury rate. So that's where I was getting back to looking at the age of the population too. Because if you can see a lower re-injury rate, a very low re-injury rate amongst very young people like 15, 16, 17, 18, you've really got something there then because those people are the ones that don't follow protocols. They don't listen to your instructions. All they know is they're 10 foot tall and bulletproof, we like to say, and they they're just going to go hard, hard, hard. And if you have a low re-injury rate amongst that group, you really have something worth publishing, probably a ward-worthy paper. Another thing I read, uh, sir, is uh, when there is an ACL injury, there is deafferentation in the brain. I think I read a landmark paper about the change in the neuroplasticity in the brain because the ACL has a lot of, less, it's more of a sensory organ, as you rightly said that they have, they have done the carpentry, but uh, they have they forgot to put an electric, electricity there. And naturally, when we have uh, something like loss of an ACL injury, which is an important sensory organ, uh, how, how, to de how a physiotherapist look, looks uh, at it and how this is, needs to be trained? Do we need to follow the principles of uh, motor control, uh, motor, uh, motor retraining programs? Yes, I, I think we need to look more into motor learning. You know, we, we think of motor learning from the standpoint of uh, a child developing. But remember, if the pediatric community says that adolescents last till 29, 30 years of age in some of their, some of their associations, they say that, well, they're still, the brain is still developing. And um, so we have to look at motor learning. And what happens when you learn anything new, you have to use higher brain function before it becomes automatic. So um, it becomes, it become, it's, reflect, it's, it's reflective before it's reflexive. So you reflect, you use supratentorial, cortical, frontal lobe. It, it takes a long time to learn, like learning to play the violin. But over time, it becomes more reflexive where it's automatic and that's what you're going for. Now you could argue if you take the ACL reconstructed person and you train them properly and you look with a PET scan or something, maybe you can get the brain function to look very similar to as it was in someone who's never had an ACL injury. Say you designed a study that was a matched control study. However, I would submit that if you take the training away, then they don't do, they don't continue to do training, they will revert and they will continue to need to use more supratentorial cortical brain function to perform the same task. So as long as they want to stay athletically active, they need to have some type of neuromuscular control package. And I would say it should even be sports specific. So if I want to do recreational downhill skiing, 
or I want to play tennis or what have you, soccer, I should have a series of maybe three or four exercises that I do on some type of frequency during the week, maybe for 10 or 15 minutes, just to keep my brain function uh, providing the right synapses and keeping that motor plan optimal. Uh, is there any, um, um, you know, battery of test, you know, something which um, we can do quickly? You know, is there any something like, um, you know, black box of battery test, which, which will tell us if this is what is uh, needed for the person to return to play? That's a, that's the best question you've asked. Um, <laughs> you mean like one particular thing? Is, is there something like that? Yeah, there's, I don't think there's one particular thing. I think maybe what we're learning about concussions now with neurocognitive testing, we need to try to take some of the better aspects of that and see how we might apply that with the ACL reconstructed person. But for the time being, I believe that everything we look at that you might consider impairment level measures or functional limitation measures, um, I want to see that they can assume that athletic ready position of safety with knee flexion, hip flexion, upright torso, head up, looking downfield in a variety of contexts when they do sports movements. So whether they're doing plyometrics or whether they're doing form movements or what have you, I want to see how well they can control the location of uh, their center of mass by having that kind of posture. But that provides a lot of different movement experiences. I think what you're suggesting is, could we identify one particular test? And I don't think we're there yet. I think I have exhausted my questions. Yeah, I was just going to ask if Dr. Motimat uh, has any questions you would like to okay. ask. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sir, one is related to the slides, like on the progression slide, you have mentioned one, two, three, four, five sessions. Yes. I want to know what uh, what should be the ideal gap between each session. That's or a great if, question. Uh, have, yes, yes. Like. They, I, I have them trained twice a week. I'm a big believer. If I'm a big believer in the importance of recovery, and I train them hard, but I want them to recover. I don't believe in this notion that if one pill is good, five pills are better. So if they're doing the right things and they're training, they need recovery. And it's not just muscle recovery and muscle building and all that and collagen, it's the brain, it's the synapses. Yes. It's restoring a balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system for homeostasis. And I find that I get better gains in my opinion by training them hard twice a week, once on their own. I tell them when they come to see me on Saturday, I want you to have taken Friday off. I want you to come in craving a workout. I want you to feel like you haven't trained for three or four days and there's nothing I need more than a workout. So that's how I want them. And uh, then I can really see what I've got. And when we do our testing, we don't test them fresh. I make sure they're tired. I, I, I want a worst case scenario because I very much when I sign my name to something saying that they're likely to not get injured again, I know that I've signed my name to that. And uh, I don't want to experience what I did many years ago in my career that I mentioned earlier, seeing the patient come back after I had released them, maybe a couple days later, tearing the graft. So I, I really think that the recovery is good. And I think, you know, if you think about once a week sessions for eight weeks, that's two months. So it buys time for the athlete too, to reflect and think about what role sports plays in their life and how this can become a component for the rest of their life, but maybe at a different level or maybe in a different way. Okay, sir, uh, one more uh, question that is, uh, uh, where do you place these activity monitoring systems? That is a uh, role of gadgets in uh, return to sports to return to play phase what gadgets activity monitoring systems maybe ac simple accelerometers or oh. global positioning systems like that yeah yeah 
That's very exciting. I don't use anything high tech right now. You know, my background was largely in biomechanics labs, but well before we had all the nice, we had very uh, simple uh, accelerometers and things like that. I, I think that is a tremendous frontier because you can look at not only excursions, but you can look at sudden in peaks and loads. So for instance, if someone was doing plyos or hop testing or running directional changes, you could see if you had a sudden spike that might be suggestive of instability or excessive impact. So I think, I think what you've described there is a great idea and maybe having something that is embedded in a soft, in a soft garment, a soft brace type thing that maybe they wear during training and uh, maybe ultimately they wear when they're released. Yeah. But I know we're still collecting data with that. And I know there's groups that are having these sensors like with uh, professional ice hockey and certainly with concussion training on helmets and things. So um, I do think you're gonna see more of that. And I think it just provides more and more information that's gonna help further refine the criteria that we use to decide on when someone's ready to return to play. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the information. Thank you. That was a great question. Can I ask the last one? Okay. Sure. I just wanted to know how was your experience uh, while dealing with different type of graphs? For example, when you're talking of a quadricep tendon graft versus a patellar bone tendon or uh, the uh, hamstring graft. So what? how was your experience in managing uh, normal people versus athletes, non-athletes versus athletes? So yeah. was there any variability in that as far as the return to sports? Uh, let's not go into the uh, nature of their sports in general. Yeah. Well, I, it's, I have a bit of a selection process then, Dr. Shimpy, to answer you there, because people that come to my program, the one criteria I have, it's not age related. It's that they have a passion to return to sports. So I'm already getting that population. But based on previous experiences prior to the bridge program, obviously, um, if they don't have an intention of returning to high sport, it should be easier. Their expectations for success are much lower. And it's the kind of thing that could look very good on an outcome study. If you say that they're 18 and 10 years later, not one of them re-injured their knee. And you just happen to leave out that part that they never, that nobody wanted to return to sport. You know, that'd be kind of a uh, less than less than ethical, I guess, to report it that way. But um, I treat them all the same way. It's just that the intensity um, and uh, knowing that their expectation is ultimately quite a bit different. I, I guess I would try to find what in their activities of daily living would be the rationale for why they had to have their knee reconstructed to begin with, whether it was climbing up into a tractor seat or uh, you know, working, doing manual labor of some sort or, and then try to replicate that. So we wouldn't necessarily do as much in the plyometric realm, but we try to cater the functional activities to the things that were important in their life. I have some patients now who are a little bit older and uh, they may have had an osteotomy or uh, an allograft for their medial femoral condyle. And they'll tell me right away, John, I don't want to return to soccer or running. I just want to be able to go out and uh, play and, and do things with my young children. So uh, we try to cater more to them with lesser impact. And we try to work on neuromuscular control without impact. And uh, we try to do it always within the threshold of joint pain-free limits. So many times we have to modify what we're doing. If he comes, I always ask them when they come in, how sore were you after last time? And they'll say, I was sore. And then I will say, where were you sore? And if they say it was in their glutes and their quads and their hamstrings, I go like this. But if they say it was by my joint or in the front of my knee, then I need to adjust what we did. I have to figure out, I have to figure out what we did that may have caused that. And then I, then I, I make it less intense. Along the same lines, when they come to see me for my program, I have the requirement that they only see me. They're done with physio. They're not seeing a strength coach. For two months, they belong to me. That way, if we're having any trouble, any problem, I, I know it's from me and I can make the adjustment. But if other people are working with them, it's like having uh, three different cooks prepare the meal. 
You know, it's too much of this, too much of that. And you don't know why it tastes bad. All you know is it tastes bad. So uh, that's kind of my philosophy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Manish, over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. John Island, sir. It was amazing session. It was enlightening session on a return to sports bridge program to uh, post ACL reconstruction. It was pleasure to listen to you. Thank you so much, sir. Our viewer, viewers will definitely have gained something from that this session. I would also like to thank our panelists, Dr. Ajit Dabolkar, Dr. B.S. Motimat, and Dr. Apurva Shimpi, sir. Uh, I would like to thank entire Physio TV team, Dr. Ashok Sham, sir, Dr. Rahul Chope, Dr. Apurva Shimpi, Dr. Neeraj Atavale, Dr. Nilima Bedekar, Dr. Amruta Puddar, and all other members of Physio TV. Lastly, a big thank you uh, to our viewers who have been vital in making this webinar successful. Looking forward for your support in all the webinars as well. This is Dr. Manish Rai signing off for the day. Thank you once again. Stay safe. And Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Thank once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.